Hello and welcome to our new sermon series in the book of Joel. My name is Jean-Philippe Engel. Thank you so much for joining me. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video and comment down below. Our Bible reading can be found in the book of Joel um, from chapter 1 verse 1 to verse 14. Hear the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders. Give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, The destroying locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed, the ground mourns, because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up, the oil languishes. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil, wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine dries up, the fig tree languishes. Pomegranate, palm and apple, all the trees of the field are dried up. And gladness dries up from the children of man. Put on sackcloth and lament, O priests, wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God. Because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray as we come to God's word. Father, your word is true. It is alive and active. It works in our hearts and it will always accomplish what you have purposed it to accomplish. And so, Lord, we ask now that you would work through your word, work in our hearts. Help us to become more like your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Jeff has recently been encouraging us as a staff to watch the news so that we can be informed about what is going on in the world around us. Now, I've really been keen to watch the news recently, but when I was growing up, my parents always watched the news. No matter what was happening, at 7 p.m., they put on SABC3 and watched the news. And at times, I would watch it with him because, well, I did find it quite interesting, but it was quite intriguing to to find out what was going on in the world around me. Uh, But unfortunately, a lot of the time, it was just filled with bad news. There's a war going on, some people were killed, Um, the day zero is almost here. And watching and reading the news recently, it gets you sad because not much has changed. There's still so much evil in the world. I mean, for example, a few weekends ago, 21 teenagers were killed at a Shabin in the Eastern Cape. No one knows how it happened, no one knows why it happened, no one even knows what happened. But what we do know is that it is a tragedy. The community is in an uproar over these deaths. The youngest person who died was 13 years old. What a sad occasion. And the news is there to tell us about our world. It helps to keep us up to date with current events. It has a message to tell us. Well, in our passage this morning, God is speaking to you. See, Joel acts as a news anchor telling the people of Judah that God has told him that the locust plague that they're experiencing now is nothing compared to what is coming. This, God is going to say, is a warning sign and a call for them to come back to him. 
because something worse is coming. God is screaming to his people to repent and to turn from their sin or face the wrath that is to come. Well, let's look at our passage. Joel chapter 1, starting in verse 1. And it says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders. Give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. Well, welcome to the first in a three-part series on the book of Joel. Now, Joel was a prophet in Judah. Uh, we don't really know when he wrote this book, only that he wrote it, that it is the word of the Lord that came to Joel. And like many of the prophetic books in the Old Testament, his message was that judgment is coming. Therefore, the people of Judah were to repent and turn to God. So what we are going to see through our three weeks together is that God's judgment is real and it is coming. But he has made a way to escape that judgment. Now Joel addresses this prophecy to everyone in Judah and calls them not only to just listen to what God is saying, but also to tell their children about it and for their children to tell their children and so on. This is an important message from God that he once told to everyone. It affects every single person. So let's listen to what God has to say. Let's read, pick it up from verse 4. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust has left, the destroying locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and wail all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed, the ground mourns, because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up, the oil languishes. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil, wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine dries up, the fig tree languishes. Pomegranate, palm and apple, all the trees of the field are dried up, and gladness dries up from the children of man. So the people of Judah, they were going through an intense ordeal. They had four different locust plagues, and they also had fires that raged and burned all their crops. They had nothing left. What the Bible is describing here in verse 4 of chapter 1 isn't merely a few locusts, you know, that you find scattered in your garden. No, it is a proper swarm. Think 10 plagues of Egypt big. Now here are some facts about locusts. A locust swarm can have as many as 80 million locusts. It can be as big as a thousand square kilometers or roughly half the size of the city of Cape Town. And no, I'm not talking about the city center, CBD. I'm talking about the municipality of Cape Town. Now that didn't really seem to have any effect on you. So here's a map of the city of Cape Town. Now if we cut this in half, then that would be the size of a locust swarm. That is one locust swarm. The people of Judah had four. It's estimated that a locust swarm the size of Paris can eat the same amount of food in one day as half the population of France. To say it another way, a swarm of locusts can eat the same amount of food in one day as 33 and a half million people. The fields are destroyed. The seeds of the plants shrivel up. The animals are confused because there's no way for them to graze. There is no water. The devastation that the people of Judah were facing is immense. 
See, a locust plague is no joke. And God tells his people to wake up, to look at the destruction around you. Look at all that is happening to you and realize that it is divine judgment. God calls them to see that the vine is gone. There's no water. There are no grapes or wine. The wine is gone. Let's read from verse 10. The fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up. The oil languishes. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine dries up. The fig tree languishes. Pomegranate, palm and apple, all the trees of the field are dried up. And gladness dries up from the children of man. Everything that brought them joy has been taken from them. Everything. C.S. Lewis says in his book, The Problem of Pain, we can ignore even pleasure. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Then at the end of chapter 1 and in chapter 2, God says, well, you think this is bad? Listen to what is coming. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. You see, God is warning His people. He tells them what is coming. God wants His people to know that while what they are experiencing now is bad, It is nothing compared to what is coming, the day of the Lord. And the theme of the day of the Lord can be found in basically all of the prophetic books in the Bible. It's described as a day of judgment, the day when God will come in power to judge everyone. The Old and New Testament are full of warnings to flee this day, to beware this day, to shudder at the knowledge that this day is coming. I can just imagine the prophet Joel going around and telling everyone about this prophecy, shouting at them that this day is coming, that it's near, a day of thick darkness and gloom, a day unlike any other they have seen before. When I think of this day, what comes in my mind is a disaster movie. You know, it's probably be directed by someone like Steven Spielberg or, or Christopher Nolan. But as it is described here in the passage... There's almost no hope of escaping it. The movie would end with despair. No one can escape. It would be like a nightmare you have every now and then. The one where you wake up sweating and scared. Only you're still in the nightmare. You know, the day of the Lord is no joke. It is no joking matter. And unfortunately, we treat it as such. And I can imagine the people of Judah in Joel's day just going along with their lives and not really listening to him at all. You see, like Joel, our message as Christians is the day of the Lord is coming. So come back and repent. Believe the gospel. The end is nigh. But people couldn't care less. People don't care because they don't believe that God is coming back. They don't believe that when he comes back, that he will come back in judgment. Are you one of those people? Are you thinking to yourself, ah, oh, man, there's this another crazy Christian that will probably stand on the side of the road with a sign that says, the end is nigh. Ah, oh, what a silly person. Well, friends, don't mishear me. Don't mishear the word of the Lord. Judgment is coming. It's not long now. So don't bury your head in the sand and, and hope that it's going to pass you by. Don't think to yourself like the rich man in the parable of Jesus. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry. Are you listening to God's words? Are you listening to what He is saying? 
God tells us that judgment is coming. But God calls us to run to him. Listen to verse 13 to 14 from chapter 1. Put on sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God. Because grain and offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God. And cry out to the Lord. Verse 12 to 14 of chapter 2 says, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. And rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Now, whenever we do something wrong, our natural response should be to ask for forgiveness. In Judah's case, they were called upon by God to repent of their sin and turn back to God. The judgment that God brought upon them was there to aid them in realizing that what they were doing was wrong and they needed to change. I remember when I was younger, uh, I was playing in the yard while my dad was busy working in the garden or something. And we had this little wall, probably around half a meter tall, um, and I loved playing on it. My, my dad could, could see that if I fell, I would get really hurt really bad. So he told me not to walk on the wall, which I didn't, because technically I was climbing up on the wall and then jumping off it. I mean, jumping and walking are two very different things. So my dad told me to stop doing that, because if I did that, then I would get hurt, and he would discipline me for not listening to him. Then, like a good son, I listened for a few seconds. But as soon as his back was turned, I thought, now, now is my chance. I climbed up that monstrous wall 50 centimeters and jumped triumphantly off it only to fall and hurt myself. And my father, being true to his word, scolded me and disciplined me, uh, which is why I now have a fear of heights. <laughs> But like my father, God warns his people that if they are not going to heed his warning and stop their sin and repent and turn to him, an even greater, even greater judgment will come upon them. And remember, God doesn't lie. What he says will happen. So therefore, in these verses, God calls them to repent, to turn from their ways and follow him, to run to him. Verse 13 of chapter 2 reminds the listeners, listeners that God is a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, that He relents over disaster. See, in these calls to repentance, God shows His people that He wants them to come back to Him. He wants them to escape the coming wrath. He wants them to flee it. He is giving them a way out. And the beginning of verse 13 calls them to rend their hearts, not their garments. See, in those days, one of the acts of repentance was to tear your garments as a sign that you are repentant. And the assumption there from verse 13 is that it became an easy way for people to repent without really repenting. See, they were happy to do the outside work so that people could see, while on the inside, nothing changed. And God is saying to his people that he is looking for true repentance, not the fake kind. He seeks people who will truly turn from their sin and follow his way of living. See, the Bible says that God knows our hearts. He perceives our thoughts from afar. Nothing is hidden from him. And you might be able to fool everyone around you, but you're not fooling him. But how do they know that God will relent from the coming disaster? How will they know if, if they will truly be saved from it if they repent? All they need to do is look at their history See, the book of Judges is one book that they can go to. See, it follows a cycle. The cycle goes like this. Israel follows other gods and worships them. God then uses another nation as his instrument of judgment against Israel. Israel realizes that what they're doing is wrong, and they cry out to God. 
God hears them. God raises up a judge in Israel to save them. Israel enjoys peace under God's rule. The judge dies and the cycle starts up again. All they need to do is see that when they are repentant, truly repentant, God forgives their sin and relents from destroying them. But what about you? See, like Judah, all of us are facing God's wrath. The Bible says that we are all by nature objects of God's wrath because of our sin, because of our rebellion against Him. See, we don't want to follow His way of living. We don't want to live under His Lordship. We want to do it our own way. Well, if you're not a Christian, you are under God's wrath. And that day of the Lord is coming. So God is calling you to turn from your sin and follow His way of living so that you can escape that dreadful day of God's judgment. See, He's calling you to run to Him. Hebrews 10 verse 31 says that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So yes, that day is coming, that dreadful day of the Lord. But like our passage this morning, God wants us to escape it. God wants you to escape it. So he made a way. He sent his son to take the punishment that we deserve so that we don't have to face that terrible day. All you need to do is believe in him. So are you listening? The day is coming and God is waiting for op- with open arms for you to run to him. So are you going to? God is calling his people, he's shouting at them that he's judging them and they need to return to him, otherwise something worse will happen to them. See, God shouts to us in our struggles. It is his megaphone to rouse a world that will not listen to him. So maybe there's something that you're struggling with at the moment. A sin that you just cannot seem to overcome. And you're listening to the lies of the devil that say, God won't forgive you. I mean, you're way too far gone, far gone for God to even care about you. Or maybe you're like the people of Judah and are happy to have an outward appearance of repentance, but there's nothing going on in your heart. When you're happy for it to seem like you're repenting, but you're not willing to go the extra mile and actually try and fight your sin. You see, God is saying to you this morning, return to me, come back to me. I am gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in love. If you turn from your sin, God will forgive you. As the songwriter says, our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Are you listening to God? Are you hearing what he has to say to you this morning? Let's pray. Father, as we think about your word, as we think about this judgment that is coming, Lord, we, we are so grateful to you for Jesus. We are so grateful to you that he took our place on the cross. That you sent him to take your wrath so that we didn't have to. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you that you are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. May we trust you and run to you. Amen.